I've only got 35 minutes, so I've got me uh, robot here. Yeah. Oh, wake me up. Hello, everybody, and uh, sorry, it's been a really good day by the sound of it, but I am going to keep the clothes on. Um, and, uh, just so you know, even though I do have leg legs of a teenager. But um, this is a bit serious, actually, after all the lovely things you've seen. Um, because my talk is, is quite practical, really. It's just about how I work and where I work and what I do. So sorry if it's a bit sort of, you know, levelling at the end of the day. Um, so the boys uh, from It's Nice That have been to my room many, many times, and uh, this is where I work. It's full of lots of interesting things. I get lots of presents and uh, things sent from all around the world every day. I had a, ni a nine-year-old write to me with some design ideas this morning, and... Uh, they were good, actually. I might use them. <laughs> and, uh, and an 84-year-old as well. And uh, recently made a, a black dress for a lady who's 100 and always wanted a Paul Smith dress. And we made it one in three days. So these are, that's my racing. You probably know I'm, I love cycling. So those are all my racing jerseys that from Bradley and Mark. First names, you know. First name terms, you know. Yeah, Mark and Victoria and Chris, you know. Actually, they are from them as well. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I th this is for the boys. Look, you see, there they are. Oh, you see, that's it. Can I go now? Is that it? Anyway, um, basically, uh, what I thought I'd do is just tell you uh, uh, how, where, how I started and, and how I work. And hopefully, you know, something will be interesting. Um, I, from the age of 11, um, when I got my first racing bike, I just uh, started uh, racing at the age of 12, actually. I got my bike at 11, started racing at 12. Um, wanted, to, uh, dreamt of being a professional racing cyclist, which of course I never would have been, because I was not nearly good enough or brave enough. But that's what I wanted to do. So consequently, actually, I had no, uh, no, idea about any creative thing at all at all my dad was in hindsight was quite a creative person because he was a amateur photographer and uh, I used to go in the dark room with him up in the attic and uh, he used to do all these developing and printing himself and watching all the you know the pictures come up um, in the chemicals it was that was that was good so that was very creative anyway um, at the age of eight, uh, 17 I had a bad crash broke lots of bones ended up in hospital for three months, came out of hospital after three months and you know, met a few of the guys that also were in the hospital. One of them said, let's go to the Bell Inn in Nottingham, which uh, is where I come from. And by chance, after going there a few times, by chance started talking to people. It was the place where all the local art students went. So all this stuff came into my head, you know, something called Bauhaus and Warhol and pop art and condition skin and just stuff I'd never heard of before and I thought god this is interesting I wonder if you can actually earn a living doing something that's really nice like this you know and sort of creative and going blue and everybody you know <laughs> things like that you know like you know, and, and, you know, keep doing this with your hair you know, you know. <laughs> anyway I realized pretty quick that you can't do that um, but but anyway um, I, so my first job I, I met um, one of the students there, her dad was setting her up in a little shop and uh, I was, uh, I'd been working in a clothing warehouse since the age of 15, left school when I was 15, left school on a Friday, started work on a Monday, never had a, a proper holiday at all ever for, for, until recently. And um, so I, I, I helped her start, start this little shop. And after, after three years, well, I was with her for six years, but after three years, I met um, Pauline, who uh, was my uh, girlfriend then, became my girlfriend, is now my wife. Um, I only, uh, this was in 1856, <laughs> June. Uh, and um, I only married her in the year 2000, because I wasn't sure whether I liked her. You know, it was just like, you know, it was take, I take time, you know. And, um, no, but she trained at the Royal College of Art down the road as a fashion designer. So she, you know, she came to live with me in Nottingham and we, we just, uh, she, she sort of taught me everything I know about uh, how, to, how to make patterns, you know, cut patterns and how to make clothes. And, and luckily, uh, her, 
she was taught about couture fashion, so it was very much about how things are made properly uh, and the construction of clothes and the proportion of the clothes, and, um, and that was brilliant. So she was my teacher. And then after three, six years, she kept saying, you know, you could have your own little shop because, you know, you've got lots of energy and ideas. So I started working on my day off, which was a, a Monday, and I saved up 600 quid and eventually opened a shop that literally was 12 foot square or three meters square. Had no, I called it a shop, it was actually a room down a little alleyway, had no windows. I'd pleaded so much with this local tailor that I wanted a shop that eventually he just said, oh, take this room at the back. And uh, it was no money. He, didn't, he let me have it free for, for three months. Then it was 50 pence a week. <laughs> and then I got an overhead, <laughs> you know, it's like really scary. But, um, uh, but uh, the key thing, and this is serious, the key thing was I'd been to see this talk by Edward de Bono, the lateral thinker from America, and he says lots of interesting stuff, but he said something like, the job always changes you and you never change the job. I can tell you, anybody who's starting out, that's a top tip. Because basically, you know, what happens is slowly the job can change you because you compromise or you do things you shouldn't do or um, you do things for, strictly for the money. So um, what I read from that was I thought, well, I've got this shop that's actually, a lot of the things were what Pauline had made. And then there were things that nobody outside of London had got at all. So actually in a provincial town, nobody was really interested in my little shop. So I thought, how the job's going to change me. So that means that I'm going to go bankrupt. You know, I'm not going to earn any money. Uh, um, so I only opened the shop Friday and Saturday. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I did lots of freelance work. I worked for people like Face Magazine and Styling and I designed fabric and I did um, help with photo shoots and um, made clothes for those bands that some of you might have heard called the Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin and David Bowie and things like that. And so the key thing through this talk is balance. It's about, I'm sorry, no microphone. It's no compromise, absolutely the shock. Hmm, quite good. <laughs> um, so it was... Uh, sorry. It gets better. The, so the thing is, Friday and Saturday, no compromise. So if you're a graphic designer, an animator, whatever, stick by your guns, keep your purity, but you've got to earn some money. Pay the rent. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday, paying the rent, Friday, no, well, that thing, anyway, that, that thing, paying the rent, Friday and Saturday, purity. That's why I'm here today, because slowly people say, oh, there's this little shop in Nottingham, and it's quite interesting, and they've got these funny things called 501 Levi's that nobody could get in England at all, and I used to bring over from New York. So keep your purity, so if you want to be a graphic designer or whatever, or you are, get Get, keep your good jobs, but earn some money so you don't end up compromising. Um, I eventually did a collection, which was seven years after I opened the first shop. Um, very tiny. We call them collections, you know, because they collectively work together, rather than ranges, so all the colours work, and it all works out. Anyway, I, I uh, took the first little collection to Paris, and uh, this is... This is the important thing, you know, so I have so many young designers come to me and they just think it's about doing this and saying blue and networking, but it's about all this stuff. You know, of course design, of course uh, that's, that's very important, but communication, that just means talking to people. Um, individuality, absolutely vital, and you've seen a lot of that today with all the amazing people that have talked here today, and characters and honesty and humour. Um, personality, that's the same thing. Quality, in my case, so uh, quality of the clothes, but also quality of the job. And then much, much more. Um, uh, right, what does that say? Oh, yes. Um, these are a few little things, sentences, that go happen in my head a lot. And um, so make room to break the rules. That's a pretty obvious one. 
You can't do it without doing it. So that was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So I've packed vo boxes, I've written invoices, I realise that VAT doesn't mean vodka and tonic. So, you know, it's, it's things like that. Uh, <clears throat> I thought when I got an OBE it was one boiled egg, but it wasn't. Um, <clears throat> this is a good one. You see, that's the thing about not compromising. So, do things that are correct, right? Not which are easy. So that means, you know, take a breath. One of the best things somebody ever told me was like, if, you, if somebody comes to you and says, I've got this idea, can you try, you know, design this car for me and this, it's going to be really brilliant. You just say, that sounds really great, but um, let me just think about it overnight and I'll come back to you tomorrow. And it's amazing how once you give yourself some time to <sighs> take a breath, you probably realise it actually isn't the right thing to do, and it is the easy thing to do. So, you know, that's a, that's a pretty good one. My company motto, you know when you're, I'm so, you know, um, so you're allowed um, a coat of arms, so this is mine. It's a coat with lots of arms. <laughs> and um, uh, it, so it, the company motto is never assume, and that has helped me so much. I, I promise you, it's really good. Never assume, and all that means is just check it out. Don't think the DHL parcel is coming, track it. Don't think that that will be ready on time, ring three days in advance. I promise you, that little, those two little words have saved me grillions of pounds, and that's a lot. You can find inspiration in everything, and if you can't, you're not looking properly. You've probably heard me say that before, and that it just means um, looking and seeing, because a lot of people look, but they don't see. And unfortunately, probably all of us, including me, we spend too much time looking at a little screen these days. So, and sat nav, it, you, before you'd look for the pub on the corner next to the church, and our eyes were being used in a different way a lot. So, I, I came, that's a lot to do with balance, in my opinion, and the fact that you still got to look and see. And then you can find inspiration in anything. I mean, you can find inspiration in all of these things. I'm sure you all know that, so sorry if I'm patronising, but you know. Uh, it could be Matisse, it could be Rothko, uh, the colours, it could be music that is really um, exciting. It could be music that goes like this and then goes like this. But to me, I see that as a navy blue suit and a bright pink shirt. So that's the way it works. Anyway, more stuff. Um, so you can find inspiration in anything. Um, Rajasthan, India, can you see all the lovely colours together? So the ochre next to the green, the pattern and the pattern. So that could be uh, pages on a book or it could be clothes, it could be anything. So that's just observing and then just enjoying the colours. Uh, this is a church in uh, Vilnius that I went to and I got a shirt from that. It was a, it was a dark brown, yellow, green and grey striped shirt from that picture. And it, hasn't sold at all. <laughs> no, it did, actually it did. I was just a joke. Uh, I mean, this is just for a library, just going to the library, just a, you know, a book on Guatemala, and Guatemalan textiles, and then taking the influence, not copying, absolutely not copying, especially somebody in my position these days, because you absolutely get sued, so just uh, take the influence from those fabrics I saw in, in, in the library, in uh, traditional Guatemalan fabrics. Uh, and they work really well. Uh, as you know, we're, we're quite famous for our stripes. Uh, a lot of people uh, create the stripes on uh, the computer, uh, but you're very reliant on the printout and the color, the quality of your computer. So what I do is, if you look at the bit above the line, that's a computer printout, and if you look at that bit, that's a piece of card with yarn that's wrapped around it. And that's how we do all of our stripes. And you see the richness of those and the flat character of the top. And from that, I can get the actual colours, which I can give the yarn numbers to the sock maker or the, you know, the, etc. So there's another one. So. It can take 20 minutes, or it can take an hour, and so we get our scarves, our shirts, our everything from, from that by using yarn and seeing the relationship between the two yarns. 
Um, t just uh, bored in the back of a taxi in Osaka with the camera on a long lens, uh, on a long exposure. That became a scarf. Um, you know, go to an exhibition, and that became a piece of fabric. That is, is pretty close to the others, actually. Right? Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think we'll move on, shall we? Yeah. <laughs> Beach hut, sweater. Beach hut, sweater. <laughs> Beach hut, sweater. <laughs> Beach hut, sweater. <laughs> so it's all about using your eyes, really. And you just say, you look at a beach hut and say, great sweater. <laughs> oh, well, that's what I do, anyway. Yeah. We made some stamp, um, a Union Jack flag out of postage stamps that ended up being this uh, material, which was, became a, a lining of a, of a jacket. So again, just having an idea, photographing it, and that became a lining for a jacket. Taking pictures at the Chelsea, Chelsea Flower Show became... became uh, fabric and also became all these clothes, so that's going to the Chelsea Flower Show, beep, beep, taking pictures, then it became fabric, and then it became uh, T-shirts, skirts, etc. So, because um, I never had any formal training, and because Pauline was really my teacher, I tend to design things that are pretty simple, you know, like a jacket looks like a jacket, it's not got, um, like my coat of arms, it's not like that, it's just it's very simple, so colour's really important because when you do simple things, you, you can make them look different with colour. So taking influence from anything by using your eyes. So that's the security guard in, in Beijing, I think. And then that's, you know, I called it Eve Klein blue rather than security card blue. But, you know, <laughs> I thought it you know, had more, sounded better, you know. Oh yes, that's my Eve Klein suit. Eve Klein suit. I can't speak anymore. Anyway, so you can also take your influence from um, just uh, for colour from a picture. So that's just an apartment that was in a magazine, and then you can see I picked up the colours from the from the apartment, and that became the colours for a knitwear collection. So use your eyes, use your eyes. It's all there for you, free of charge. This book, if you're interested in, is is really nice book. It's photographs from 1900, and the colours are so strange and weird um, that I use them as um, for a reference for all my knitwear. So that they became socks, scarves, knitwear, but all taken from this one book. And then you've got obviously the boss, you know, Henry Matisse. I'm sure you all know that's this snail painting. Maybe you don't all know that at the top left corner is a little snail. Can you see the shape of the little snail on the top? Anyway, he's good. He was good at colour. <laughs> yeah. And he, um, I, I just like the way he put, put colours together. So if you put like red and orange together, it looks very Warhol, very pop. If you put navy and white together, it looks like I've got a boat in the south of France. Uh, so. By using colour in different ways, you can send out different messages. Um, so when you have a fashion show, it costs about a quarter of a million quid for 12 minutes. And you've got uh, a catwalk up the middle, and you've got two sides to the audience. You've got the press, and buy the press one side, and the buyers the other side. So in 12 minutes, 15 minutes, and a lot of money, you've got to say to the press, I've got new ideas. This, um, this would look good on a page, and you've got to let the buyers know that they can pay the rent. So when you do a fashion show, uh, it's important for the press that you've got eye-catching things. So, for instance, this is a corduroy suit, and the one going down the other way is a uh, lemon corduroy suit. We sold about 10 of them. But when you buyers came into the shop, uh, into the showroom to, buy, to order them, you buyers ordered 50 black or 50 navy or 50 geography teacher green or something. But the key thing is if I showed a black suit on the catwalk, it wouldn't have the same impact. So 
it's again about balance. So you need attention-seeking things for your fashion show, and then you need the more sellable thing inside. But you, one doesn't really work without the other. So, for instance, this is a very old photograph, 1980-something. But, you know, when Mr. Ferry was slim. Ooh. Bitch! <laughs> um, um, yeah, but that coat, you know, we sold, the majority of those coats were sold in navy blue, uh, black, and that sort of lovely colour. But I made um, a red one for the catwalk, so I got, the, and it got on the front cover of a magazine. So, it, it, again, it's very much about working out the attention-seeking things and the rent payers. This is, again, this is 1982, so it's very normal to see this today, very normal, but... I was in Florence and I was standing on a hill and I could see the famous Duomo. And then I looked to the left and there was the Duomo on a, on a bus. And I thought, that's amazing to get a photograph on a bus. I mean, what, you know, now, as I say, it's really normal, but just the, the idea of having something that shouldn't be on something. So that eventually get, led me to think about, that is a, that I bought a, an old rucksack, a backpack, four, four quid, and then I laid it on some glass, photographed it, and then that's printed onto the, onto the fabric. And that just came from a bit of lateral thinking and a, a bit of you know, seeing that, seeing oh, a photo on a bus, and then you think, oh, a photo maybe on a shirt. And that was in 82. The factory was, at uh, that time, was only on a two-day week. And then with my observation that factory then went on to working full time because we were selling so much photo print before i mean it's very normal now a bit like the beach hut you know when you're walking down the road and suddenly see uh you know a packet of seeds in a <coughs> gardener shop and then i just think shirt <laughs> so that's another thing really you know shirt <laughs> close up of a shirt uh, this next bit's a bit grown up. Uh, this is, you know, the process of, of the industry. So um, you've got to make nice clothes at the right price, beautifully made, um, deliver them on time, get paid, and then you've also got to promote the clothes somehow. And that's, uh, as you know, through either through marketing, networking, social media these days, but also paper advertising, which is, in my industry, still quite important. So these are some of the images from, um, you know, for, that we would print in Vogue or GQ or something like that. Um, and I'm just going to show off for a minute, but I took these pictures because I'm cheap. cheap. <laughs> we used to use Mario Tista, you know, and David Bailey. And then we got the invoices, so my lot said, well, you can take pictures, can't you? So you take them. So, so, so that's why I'm... So this is it's just some of our advertising campaign. We don't spend a lot of money on advertising, actually, but um, that's, uh, that's just some of the examples. Right, as I said, I thought this is a bit traditional, this bit, isn't it? Um, When I see a lot of uh, young designers, they say to me that um, the... I, I mean, I had a young lady in about four weeks ago. And she just left uh, college uh, last year, and she said to me, well, you know, I really want my own collection. I want my own uh, label. And I said, well, what's the what's a sort of the main thing that you really think you need? She said, uh, a PR and a catwalk show. But she got no money, no manufacturer, uh, didn't know how to run a business or anything. So it's really dangerous that so many young people think that they, um, they need the fashion show and the PR first, and then the next thing they want is a shop. Uh, but in fact, this is her shop on her head. And in Antigua, you're not allowed to sell things on the beach, but you know, when nobody's looking, she goes, do you want to buy a T-shirt? <laughs> so, I, I, I can't stress enough, going back to my 12-foot square shop at the beginning, that a shop can be as humble as you like, and, and you could even just sell to a few mates. So don't worry about starting here, because especially in today's you know, false climate, because up to the year 2008, the 15 years before 2008, we were all living this false life, and now hopefully it's coming back to reality. So 
be humble, keep your feet on the ground, and I'm sure you can do well. I mean, these guys, I'm going to show you now, made their shop from an old uh, fridge box. So there's their shop in their hand, and when the police are not looking, that's it. So, you know, you can keep it, you can keep it humble, shop. <laughs> and that was, a, that was a big influence for, for me when I see these people trading in such an interesting and humble way. And then, so that, that's really how I started, you know, having things in my shop, which were not just clothes. And especially in the 12-foot square shop, because in the 12-foot square shop, there was just a door and no windows. And so when somebody came in, it was very confrontational. So they were there immediately. Uh, and so it was a, a useful tool to have things that were other than clothes, saying, oh, have you seen I just got this uh, book or I just got this um, from an antique market? And it was a real good icebreaker. The, dog, uh, the, the shop manager was my Afghan hound, actually. And uh, the shop was only 12 foot square. He was called Homer, not from The Simpsons, from the Iliad, because I'm very intellectual. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and the, anyway, so that when the people used to walk in, I mean, we looked exactly the same, big nose and long hair. And they always welcomed him, he said hello to him first. But the shop was always crowded, because it was only 12 foot square, and there was an Afghan hound and me in it. So these things were really useful. So not just having clothes, but having a scooter or a vinyl or some books and even, you know, decorating the, the changing room with postage stamps or even the, the sort of shop sign not being just a typical black shop sign, but, you know, a painted one or one made out of uh, an, old, an old picture frame or something. The next little chat, and I can see I'm running out of time. Um, next, uh, next little chat is really about effort. And at work, uh, I always say to everybody, effort is free of charge. So this is not a big deal what I'm showing you now, but I'm just, just showing you anyway. So this is somebody's house, and this is their neighbor. So I think the one in the pink house has made a bit more effort. <laughs> that's it, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah like, you're like, <sighs> yes, rock and roll. <laughs> And this pub, uh, you probably know it, <coughs> is quite busy, but this pub is always busy. So it's just um, a simple thing about saying, you know, if it is free of charge, make a bit more effort, make your shop window look special, make your presentation pack look special, make your character be more special. You know, that's the wall of my showroom in, in Milan, for instance. It was always getting graffiti, so I got a graffiti artist to do it, and now it's never been graffitied anymore, which is great. Um, windows as well, you have about this much time by a window so you've got about you know 15 seconds so if you can do something which is just eye-catching uh, whatever it is um, that's a shirt that's got a Union Jack on it but we put it on the flagpole that's just a silly man um, that's you know just things so it's things to make make you stop yeah and it, it does work, it really does work. And we, you know, we have shops in quite a lot of places now and, and we have, always have shops that are quite, quite funny. And the guy who does the, one, the windows in London is so great. His most awesome one was a totally empty shop, uh, window, totally empty window in Covent Garden where I'm paying so much rent and he put, didn't put any clothes in it. And he just said, due to inclement weather, we've all gone to the Cayman Islands. And it was just written on a post-it note about this big, yeah. It's like, Lance, you know, can you put a shirt in? <laughs> yeah. We all know about this. You know, the world is full of all of us, you know, cars, restaurants, graphic designers, fashion designers, too much choice. So I walked down uh, Berwick Street and I just thought, well, I wonder if you walk down the street where you've got the same choice, the same chance all the time. So, you know, they sort of have all the fruit and veg down there. So he's Mr. Untidy. He's Mr. Tidy. So just interesting how people, you know, a street where you're all selling the same product through effort, through thought, through something. And then I thought, what about tomatoes? I mean, tomatoes, tomatoes, tomatoes on the vine and on tissue paper. Now they have got to taste better. <laughs> so you see, I think he's pretty clever and this one's done display.
Uh, so, how are we doing? Am I got to? You've not flashed a green light yet, have you? All right. Okay. Um, so uh, this is like so many magazines look so similar today, but you know when you look back in time. Uh, when is that? Can we say? Oh, yeah, 1945. You know, it's just sad that you know we were so locked into. We must have Mr. Amani on the cover because he spent eight pages of advertising. You know, it really is like that. Um, and so, a lot. Sadly, a lot of creativity has gone from um, covers and and content. Look at that, 1935 with the copy like that and the photo like that. I mean, that's so special, isn't it? And then I'm sure you all know him, Brodovich, but he was brilliant because he did a deal with his publishers and just said, um, I'll give you a great magazine that panders to the advertisers and the big posh designers, but I want a few pages to myself. So it's all about the old balance again. So these pages are all about posh. And then, you know, the central pages, he's, he had four or six pages in the centre that he said, OK, I will give you a good magazine, but I want a few pages for myself. So I think that's 1958, maybe somebody could read it. And that's a young illustrator called Andy Warhol and a photographer called Richard Avedon. So, you know, that, that's another top tip is like, you know, pay the rent, but keep the image high. And he was brilliant at that. He used people like Lillian Bassman, who was uh, one of the first, she sadly just passed away, but um, she's one of the first people to, you know, paint onto photography, which was great. Um, I think, have I done yet? Can I keep going? <laughs> oh yeah, okay. Um, I just like the way they only wore black, red and white. So I thought I'd just say, yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Well, I mean, that was very image conscious, wasn't it? You know, and that was, you know, they very authentic. These are, this is the bit on the earlier that said individuality. So, you know, I've got lots of shops around the world. So just to show you a few shops. So this is showing off, I suppose, a bit. Sorry. <laughs> so, the, you know, this is an old shop. Oh, sorry. Uh, this was built in 1850. It's in Notting Hill Gate. Uh, old on the outside, very spanking new on the inside. Uh, and on the top floor, bespoke tailoring, but with Andy Warhol pictures on the wall. So old and new uh, on the outside, new on the inside, etc. This is a shop in Milan. This is a bit boring, this bit. This is, this is a lovely shop. This is built in 1735, and it's got a 100-foot garden. It used to be an old townhouse. Original staircase. Um, that's got an art gallery on the top. That's a um, really nice shop, that. It's four floors with a roof garden and an art gallery. That's the bookshop downstairs. I know I'm going quick, but they'll tell me off. This is um, Terminal 5, so I hate airport shops, but I said, if you'll let me do it my way, I'll open one. And it does really well, and it, it, they're really pleased with it, because it's, it's the only shop in, in any airport in the world that's got an old shop front, uh, Yorkstone and parquet floor. Um, and if you... If you Put up your fight, and you could probably do okay. Bangalore, Johannesburg, that's a residential uh, a house that I put a glass top on. Where's that one? Korea. This is lovely. This is an empty restaurant for 35 years, and I've just moved in and not done anything at all. Also, not sold anything. <laughs> <laughs> but I like it. It's a nice thing. <laughs> I mean, terrible. I suppose it's because I didn't even bother putting Paul Smith on the front. <laughs> <laughs> they keep coming in asking for coffees and you've got silk shirts. <laughs> yeah, that's it inside. It's really great. Um, Faubourg. This is one of the rooms in the shop on Faubourg Saint Honoré, and the brown bits either side of the door are two and one P coins that are glued to the wall. And uh, that people, like, you see them going up there trying to pick them off, you know, like that. <laughs> Sorry, it's getting a bit boring, isn't it? San Francisco, New York. It's quite quick, quick. Look at this one. Ah, oh, that's a cracker, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought LA, sitting in my little, you know, we, do, we have an in-house uh, shop design team. So we do all our own shops around the world from, not, from my Covent Garden headquarters. And I thought, you know, LA, 
40 miles across, every street is really straight, most people don't walk. Uh, so really, you've just got to build the Eiffel Tower to draw attention to it. So you've just got to do something that's really bright and bold. And um, so I did a big pink box. And you see all break marks on the street where the expats are going along. We go, Paul Smith shop, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, that's what I hope, anyway. I think it's true. This is the inside, so I made it like a... Because it's in West Hollywood, so I made it like a... Like an old uh, set inside. Um, I think I, was, I should start, Will, don't you think? Oh, am I right? You've not gone off yet, has he? Uh, the, the thing about today being a fashion designer is that, you know, the... Uh, my fashion show was last Sunday. It was streamed live. So all, all the high street brands can see everybody's work straight away. Not, you know, I'm not saying people copy me, but you know, everything's so instant these days. So I really think that what you've got to do is have your data. Oh, that's, it. Is it? that's to wake us all up. Um, so I think, I think the main thing is you've got to have things outside of you, your, your actual job. You know, you've got to just have things that... So I take lots of pictures, I do interviews for people, design bikes, and do things. So these are just some of the things I've done outside of the job. So these are where I've done photographs for magazines, um, taking photographs for magazines. But all that enhances your sort of your, you know, what you do for a living. This is a, uh, I work for a magazine in uh, Italy as a photographer doing interiors and stuff like that. So that was that. This is a cool house in Tokyo that I photographed. That's it, I think. Can I stop? Yeah. Oh, that's my new job. Manager of Manchester United. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, I'd forgotten that one. Yeah, that's good. And um, then the people who wear our things. Clothes I did for Chet Baker. I did clothes for the movie for Bruce Weber. And that's Paul Weller because we launched his book. And that's it, I'm out of here.